So thank you very much for organizing this fantastic conference. I will talk about artificial intelligence, worker replacing technological change, and income distribution. So as a bunch of people have already observed this morning, artificial intelligence is just a continuation of a long process of automation. But what we argue makes it critically different. It's not only the continuation, but in some sense also the culmination of a long process of technological progress, because it carries the risk that we humans become entirely replaced. So that's why we have as the second line in the title, worker replacing technological change, which contrasts uh, with what Hicks in the 1930s described as labor saving technological change. And uh, as a number of people have already observed, uh, and we also believe it very strongly, the primary challenge posed by this type of worker replacing technological change will be one of income distribution. So um, when Keynes wrote in the 1930s about the economic possibilities of our grandchildren, what we had in mind was a combination of technological possibilities and utility possibilities. And we thought, let's go back to basics and let's decompose those a little bit. So let's start by considering the arrival of a new technology that replaces workers. And let's ask the question, would their standard of living necessarily decline? So the first observation that we wanted to make which at some level is very obvious, but it's still a critical observation that often gets lost in the whole debate, is that if the world was first best for the non-economist, it means if the world was free of market imperfections, then technological change would always be something wonderful because in a first best world where all markets are functioning, including all insurance markets, everybody is perfectly insured against any new technologies. And so that means an expansion in production possibilities automatically implies that everybody will be better off. Now, one beautiful thing about this is that in that kind of world, there will also be political unanimity about technological progress. If everybody shares in the fruits of technological progress, it's not going to be politically contentious, and there will be none of the kinds of discussions that we have these days about uh, redistributive effects of technological change. Now, in the real world, risk markets, especially with respect to technological change, are clearly not perfect. And I would almost say that behind every great innovation, lurks an equally great imperfection in risk markets. The majority of workers replaced by machines did not write insurance contracts against being replaced. And what that tells us is that there is a natural role for redistribution which emulates missing insurance markets rather than interfering in markets. So I think this is something critical if we are free market fundamentalists and believe the market always gets it right. And then we observe, well, there are these missing insurance markets. Then we should have no reason to object to the proposition. Let's make up for them and let's redistribute as if we had those insurance markets. Now, what are the reasons in practice why those insurance markets are missing? I have listed two here. Uh, given my co-author, of course, information problems, including the difficulty of describing the future state space. We cannot really write a contract on something very easily before it has been invented. But also providing incentives for innovators. If they were to completely ensure away uh, all their returns from innovation, then maybe some university professors, uh, including probably most of the people in the room, would still engage in innovation but maybe not all the innovators in, for example, Silicon Valley. Now, one critical distinction between those two is that information problems like describing the state space 
are something that makes it easy to deal with innovation after it has occurred, because then we know in which state we are, but very difficult to write ex ante contracts. On the other hand, if we talk about providing incentives for the innovator, those incentives are equally distorted by ex ante or ex post transfers. So if we tax the innovator ex post, it destroys incentives just as much as if we fully insure away all the returns to innovation. Okay, so given that we don't have these wonderful insurance markets, let me look at a case two. So again, we have our worker replacing technology. And now let's assume that the world is first best, so no market imperfections ex post after this innovation has occurred, which was not insured. And let's assume that redistribution is costless. So then what we can observe is that the utility possibilities frontier in that economy will unambiguously move out. So it means there always is scope to make everybody better off, even if competitive wages will decrease. So for the non-economists, this graph here, which represents the utility possibilities frontier, uh, shows us the welfare of different types of agents. Here we have assumed workers and capitalists. We have assumed a change that brings us from an equilibrium E0 to an equilibrium E1, in which workers are worse off, but capitalists are better off. But we can trace a utility possibilities frontier through those lines, which represents all the points that we could reach via redistribution. And we can see that we can easily enter this cone of Pareto improvement from the new equilibrium E1 if we redistribute from the capitalists who were the winners to the workers who were the losers of the technological innovation. So that means in that kind of world, redistribution can make everybody better off. And if it does, there is still technological unanimity. There's still nobody who will object to technological progress. Now, if the world is first best, but redistribution is limited or costly, then the constrained utility possibilities frontier, which is now constrained by the costly redistribution, may actually lie inside of the old possibilities frontier, and that's the case that we have depicted here. So given the set of institutions for redistribution in that economy, there may be no scope for making the workers not lose out. Now, if that's the case, then from the perspective of the workers, and I guess that's what Larry objected so vehemently yesterday, it may actually be desirable to limit technological change. And there will be a lot of resistance to innovation among those who lose out. So I think we economists set ourselves too easy of a goal if we just say, well, technological progress can make everybody better off. We have to ensure that it is actually also happening. Now, the important question is, how costly is redistribution? So this is uh, not a theorem now, but we believe that almost surely the distortions introduced by redistribution are sufficiently small that we could still achieve a Pareto improvement. And oftentimes, those changes in institutions have to go hand in hand with changes in the rules of the games uh, that affect the sharing of the benefits of innovation, like, for example, changes in intellectual property rights. So um, let me focus on a fourth case, which I believe does not reflect the situation of AI, but which is important to understand and keep in mind when we evaluate technological uh, innovations. If the world is not first best, so it means if we have various market imperfections, like aggregate demand problems, um, monopolies, um, information problems, and so on and so forth, the utility possibilities frontier may actually move inwards even if the po production possibilities frontiers move outwards. And that may be true even with costless redistribution. So this is one of those theoretical results that Larry was objecting to, but I think it is really important to appreciate to see how important 
our institutions and our market imperfections are in determining whether and how big of a benefit society will derive from innovation. Um, so more generally, the first best utilities possibilities frontier is the outer envelope of all conceivable constrained utility possibilities frontiers, which reflect all the conceivable institutional regimes in an economy and all the market imperfections that we may potentially suffer from in the economy. So what do we mean by institutional regimes? That includes whether we have explicit tax and redistribution systems, universal basic incomes, intellectual property regimes, but even things like social norms, for example, giving, donations. And then in terms of uh, market imperfections, some of the significant ones involve informational frictions, market arrangements, but also when we talk about technological progress, rigidities in factor reallocations or in prices that determine how easily factors and products reallocate. So changing any of these institutions or market imperfections has an effect on workers' welfare in general. And in general, it may be desirable to use a package of changes to all these institutions to ensure parade improvements after technological change has occurred. A last and fifth point to this kind of general analysis on technological progress that I want to emphasize is that we don't have a first welfare theorem for innovation. Generally speaking, the private returns to innovation in an economy differ from the social returns. And what that implies is that privately optimal innovation may shift the utility possibilities frontier inwards, even with costless redistribution and that there may be benefits from intervening in the innovation process to generate Pareto improvements, for example, by making it less labor saving or things like that. Again, in AI, it does not strike us as being an obvious example where this will be true, but I can think of examples, for example, in financial markets, if we think of high frequency trading that may actually generate Pareto deteriorations. So the critical question, and that's what uh, my remaining couple of minutes will be about, is what public policies can ensure that everyone is better off? I will spend a little bit of time on talking about redistribution in a first best economy to emphasize that it really shouldn't be all that hard. I will talk about an economy where redistribution is um, costly, so costless is unavailable, and then end with some broader remark. Now, we are also at fault, like uh, a number of other speakers, for not explicitly talking about whether these policies are likely to emerge in the, political out, uh, in the political process. And as a number of people have indicated, that's some cause for concern. But I think even the first question, what policies do we need, deserves extensive analysis. So let's start with uh, looking at worker replacing technological change in a first best economy. Let's assume we have a production function, F of capital and labor, and labor consists of human and machine labor. Um, machine labor can be produced at some cost gamma. So let's say we have invented a technology to do that. And what you can he see here very clearly is that human and machine labor are perfect substitutes. So this technology is worker replacing. In the competitive equilibrium, wages will be determined by the marginal product of labor. So let us pose two questions. What does worker replacing technological change do to the wages? And what can policy do about that? First, uh, a proposition that looks exclusively at the short run before any of the other factors in the economy have adjusted. Adding a marginal unit of machine labor reduces human wages, but increases the returns of all complementary factors in a zero sum manner. We can see that very easily by uh, differentiating Euler's theorem. Basically what happens if I add one unit of machine labor, um, that unit will earn its marginal return, but then there's also a redistribution 
from labor to capital, which now becomes relatively scarce, and the gains of capital are exactly the losses of the existing stock of labor. So um, what that tells us is we have this redistribution, which is a pecuniary externality in the absence of these missing risk markets that we had. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that the windfall gains for the complementary factor owners are like unearned rents. They have just been lucky. They haven't done anything to earn this higher return. And compensating workers simply undoes those windfall gains. And this is true no matter what the complementary factor, no matter whether it's land uh, or capital or unskilled versus skilled labor or entrepreneurial rents. So policy can undo these redistributions by taxing the windfall gains. And let me also emphasize, if we can distinguish between previously installed capital, for example, and new capital, Taxes on previously accumulated factors that suddenly earn an ex excess return are non-distortionary. So that means there is at least in principle a role for a Pareto improvement and for having costless redistribution. Um, I will jump over a bunch of things now. It turns out um, if we have um, worker replacing technological change, just uh, like uh, the paper on growth in the morning has emphasized, there may be quite significant economic change because the biggest constraint on output, which is the scarcity of labor, is suddenly lifted. Um, and that may lead to something like a singularity to exponential growth driven by factor accumulation. And in that case, the human wage would actually be unchanged, but the human labor share would go to zero. So that outcome isn't too bad for humans. But where it gets bad is if there are scarce non-reproducible factors in the economy. And if that's the case, then the non-reproducible factors will limit growth. Human wages will fall. The owners of the non-reproducible factors, like which could be uh, land or energy and so on, will make all the gains. But the beautiful thing is that non-reproducible factors cannot be distorted if we tax them because they're non-reproducible. So taxes on them are like lump sum taxes. And again, there is scope for Pareto improving redistribution. So um, we have a whole bunch of other results, but let me jump to our conclusions. What we have emphasized is that worker replacing technological change can still be unambiguously positive in a first best economy, or if it is coupled with the right form of redistribution that undoes these pecuniary externalities that arise when we add uh, the innovation to the economy. The scope for redistribution is facilitated by the fact that the changes in factor prices create windfall gains on the complementary factors, and that should make it relatively easy to achieve Pareto improvements. However, market imperfections and limits on redistribution worsen that calculus. So a Pareto improvement can no longer be ensured, but, and that may lead to resistance from those in societies who are losing. But a broad set of second best policies is desirable, including changes in intellectual property rights. And with sufficient instruments, a Pareto improvement should be possible, and innovation should always be desirable for a society. Thank you. Uh, this is a very good paper, I thought. I could imagine it becoming the definitive cited account of AI income distribution and the theory of the second best. Let me just discuss a few possible extensions. One is to consider the distribution of consumer surplus in the model more explicitly. So the action here is in the production function. But if you think of AI as being produced at declining or zero marginal cost, consumers will get a lot of output for free or very cheaply as kind of a trickle-down cargo cult. And once you take this, account, once you take this effect into account, uh, it could be much more egalitarian, the outcome. Think of Africa getting cell phones and now smartphones at quite high rates. 
And uh, I think it's even possible that economic growth of the future, the distribution of consumer surplus effect, will outweigh the what happens inside the production function effect. If software is the binding constraint, you should be more optimistic. If you think it's somehow hardware that's the binding constraint, maybe that's more likely to be constant or increasing cost. When Deep Blue beat Kasparov, that was 20 years ago, but there's actually been no chess game with as much hardware as IBM brought to 1997. But the software is much, much better. Second possible extension is to think about how IT interacts with international trade. So this is a domestic model. One effect of IT is simply that it enables more factor price equalization. It enables successful businesses to become larger. You manage an international empire by cell phone and by email and by other technologies. But if you imagine artificial intelligence and other technologies progressing further, it could be that wage differentials are no longer a reason to locate abroad at all. So you could have a reshoring of, say, American or West European manufacturing this would boost the demand for janitors here in the United States. Their wages go, would go up. It could be the big income distribution effect is that artificial intelligence will be much worse for the poorer countries who can now not industrialize through wage differentials. And it may do just fine for people who have really the lowest wage jobs, which can't be outsourced at all, people just doing physical labor. Reshoring as IT progresses could boost their wages. And that uh, inegalitarian outcome is harder to address because it's across borders. In terms of the policy prescriptions, uh, not the presentation, but I felt the paper offered too many of them. I would suggest to the author to avoid the temptation of now more than everism. So there is a list of seven or eight policy proposals, most of which I agreed with, but I think the radical one is the Henry Georgist idea to tax unimproved land and natural resources, and I would just focus on that. Uh, once we see that as the critical recommendation, it also helps point our attention to an actual real-world example and gives us a way of unpacking some of the political economy considerations. So think, what are the countries today where the citizens of that country hardly do any work? Well, some of the oil-rich monarchies, Brunei would be one example, Qatar would be another, where people get a lot of money from the government, which doesn't tax the resource of oil, but it owns the oil or the natural gas. Uh, we then see, when you think about countries like Qatar and Brunei, redistribution is a tricky concept. If the whole economy is redistributed, I fear it's not like Norway. Norway without oil would be more or less like Sweden in terms of standard of living. Brunei or Qatar without oil would be much poorer. When so much of GDP is being redistributed through politics, I wonder if this is compatible with our notions of democracy. It could just be the political forces that control the oil they make an upfront offer to the interest groups that might oppose them and in essence cement their control. They're pretty stable. They're sort of two-thirds trying to be benevolent, but they're also using a lot of that money to achieve their own ends, religious, ideological, whatever it may be. But it seems they don't really have the thick middle class, upper middle class, running the government, investing in the civic society, social capital that I think is probably required to sustain Western liberal democracy. So these worlds where we're redistributing optimally according to economic theory, uh, they might be non-democratic worlds that might in some ways make them uh, self-reversing or not very sustainable, or it may make them too sustainable, but they become sustainable just by always buying off the opposition. Looking also at, say, some of the Gulf states, it raises the question, like, what is it we're redistributing? So in simple economic models, right, it's cash. Uh, makes sense to redistribute cash in a wide variety of circumstances. But if people really are not working, I tend to think one thing we need to redistribute is status. That's harder to do. I'm not even sure what kind of model to put that in, much less how to do it. We, need, we may need to redistribute the notion of having a meaningful job. It's possible that government jobs will supply this, but it's also possible those will just frustrate people and be boring and be very low status. So, you know, can the rest of the world, say the way some academics do, fool themselves into thinking their job is really important? Maybe that's one of the norms uh, we need to produce. Some of the distribution effects in this new world where there's a lot more artificial intelligence, they may cross gender. So you already see like the bottom third of males in terms of education or skills have taken a very high penalty uh, in the sense that I think for women we have not seen is the case. 
And, uh, but on the other hand, care of the elderly, which is increasing in importance both as a job and something you do at household production, who takes care of the parents, who takes care of the children. Arguably, we're headed toward a future where the stress gap between men and women increases, and it increases in a way that is unfavorable for the women. Uh, probably we're not opposed to sending highly stressed people more income, but I'm not sure that just sending more income does that much to relieve the stress. So the general idea that in these stranger future-oriented worlds, what redistribution is or has to be is something quite different from what it is in the simple paration model. I see that as a big frontier issue where we economists really haven't done uh, much work at all. And then you combine that with political economy. The political economy probably works much better if you can redistribute status and a meaningful job. If it doesn't, you get very high rates of diabetes, obesity, lots of political discontent. Uh, and again, you already see this in a variety of countries in the world. This isn't just science fiction. Uh, in terms <coughs> of the general topic, you know, how far will AI get? One thing that struck me hearing a lot of the presentations, not this paper in particular, but I think there's a bias, not just noise, but a bias when you get together academics and tech people to talk about AI. And I've been to a bunch of AI conferences, and usually it's a mix of tech people and academics. And what they have in common is what they produce can be multiplied very rapidly. You can re reproduce research. Companies such as Facebook or a Amazon, they have scaled up very quickly. But if you went, say, to a university and for purposes of diversity invited the following few people to a conference like this, uh, say at George Mason or I teach, the person who is in charge of planning university facilities, what will expand and how you will get other people on campus to agree with it. The person in the university who handles FOIA requests, uh, they're very busy. Uh, the person in the university who raises money to help keep the university going. From their perspectives, I think the prospects for artificial intelligence are really quite limited. They tend, relative to us, to be bearish about artificial intelligence. Productivity statistics we know are low. That may be undervaluing gains, but if you look at quantities, how have quantities been moving? Uh, labor supply, real investment, those are iffy but not, extra not going extraordinarily well. That to me suggests the productivity slowdown is real and maybe less of our economy is prone to artificial intelligence than it feels to a lot of us who are in some very particular sectors. But anyway, paper I thought was great. Uh, extensions needed. We need to think about redistribution and political economy in deeper ways. And I'm a bit more optimistic than the authors because of the consumer side. Thank you. Uh, so comments and questions. We'll start with uh, Joel and then Manuel. Yeah, so I, I, I just want to add a historical point to this issue of redistribution and the kind of cost that it has. You know, historically speaking, you know, we've witnessed an enormous amount of redistribution in the last, say, 100, 150 years, which probably has prevented from the sort of Marxist uh, apocalypses of happening. And that's, of course, the fact that we haven't actually done much in redistributing income by taking cash from some people and giving it to others. Instead, we have provided this in terms of goods and services, we call sort of in general as sort of the welfare state. And so a whole bunch of things that before 1880 everywhere were provided privately. Education at all level, health at all level, old age insurance at all levels, a whole bunch of things which we now think of public were slowly provided increasingly by the states beginning with the famous Bismarck reforms of the 1880s and, and all, all the way through. Now, how costly has this been? And so there's a brilliant book by, by a colleague of mine, an economist, Peter Lindert, called Growing Public, who actually shows, and this is quite a startling thing, that actually the welfare state has been a free lunch. I can't actually fully reproduce his, his, his argument here. I mean, there's a lot going on, a lot of econometrics. But basically, if you think of the establishment of the welfare state as a redistribution uh, effort, I mean, the, the, the costs may actually not have been uh, so bad. And one of the reasons that I think Europe has been done so exceedingly well, and Europe and the, the British, like the one we're in here right, right now, have done extremely well. You know, States has had a welfare state, but always has a welfare state monkey, and which is why probably a lot more resentment in the U.S. to technological change than there is elsewhere. 
But I think th what, what Anton and Joe should be thinking about, this as an example of redistribution that really works. Don't, people, don't give people cash. Give them health insurance. Give them, you know, you know, crash to PhD education. Uh, all of that's all of it's free. All of it's subsidized, and you know that that's probably the best way of doing it. Manuel and then Eric. Yeah, um, yeah. I I want to voice some uh, skepticism about some statements, uh, Anton, that you make made in the presentation about almost surely and easy to you know and to, to implement these. Uh, redistribution schemes uh, in terms of avoiding distortions and so forth. Uh, you know, it sounds uh, kind of uh, easy and, and feasible, and, and the fact is that it's not. And, uh, you know, people have commented uh, uh, on that. Um, and there are, you know, many reasons for that. The obvious ones are that the, those that you want to take from, uh, they also have disproportionate political power. So they are going to you know, essentially prevent uh, uh, what you want to do as far as they can. <clears throat> and the system is, you know, is responsive to that particular democratic systems. So um, and that's a, a, I think, and the other mechanism is it's tax avoidance. Uh, and, uh, you know, there has been a paper recently at the uh, NBR working paper, I don't remember who was it, but they, they, they looked at the, a huge amount of uh, recent data, including the Panama Papers and so forth. And it's stunning, I mean, to, to, to see the extent of uh, tax avoidance, uh, you know, which is concentrated at the, at, the, uh, at the upper end of the tail of the distribution. And so when you see that, I mean, you realize that even if the political will was there to, you know, the things will, will siphon out. So it's very unfeasible uh, to do that. So. I will again urge to think of inclusion rather than about redistribution, okay? So essentially, and, and I, I will repeat that, you know, I, I am very skeptical of our ability to redistribute in, the, in, in your sense. I'm, I'm much more sympathetic to what you were saying, uh, Joel, but the fact is that even that has become increasingly difficult in more and more countries. Uh, so, you know, think of, you know, widening ex ante, you know, the scope of the beneficiaries of the processes, not by paying them off, but rather by including them in the, in the process. And a, one more last observation. You know, we, we, speak, we spoke so much here about the perfectibility of the machine, but there is also a huge margin to improve on human beings just by, you know, early on kind of having a, something close to equal opportunities, which we are so far from, okay? So there are huge margins there, and we need to, you know, to, to pay attention to that and invest in that, and that, in my view, will obviate the need for later, or not obviate completely, but lessen the need for redistribution. So actually, I want to build on that. Since Larry Summers isn't here anymore, um, we, we know what, what he would say, since he said it in, in advance, which is that there's um, uh, uh, real political economy issues, public choice issues. And, and um, I think in a way, you set yourselves too easy a task by t reminding us that you could do redistribution and get to the first best. And so I want to give you a much harder task, but you guys are, you and Joe are very smart. So um, maybe you can, you can uh, make some progress on it, which is, you know, really grapple with what are the ways to do this redistribution. I, Tyler brought it up a little bit as well, um, in a ways that can maybe mitigate or address some of the, the public choice and political economy issues. You know, there, there, you, can, you can redistribute money, which was sort of implicit in what you're doing, or you can do it in kind, as, as Joel was saying. People talk about pre-distribution. You can change the IP regime, and so that, you know, should Zuck, Mark Zuckerberg get the first 50 billion and then redistribute it, or should we do it another way? You know, th there are a uh, number of mechanisms that you could put in place that might be, and to make it even harder, that might be specific to the AI revolution, that would be really interesting to have you kind of flesh out which ones are likely to be uh, better off to go after. But, I, you know, you don't have to do that in your, in your comments, but maybe you can, you, can, you can start touching and pointing the way of how you would grapple with that much harder but more, more relevant part of the, of the task. Uh, yes, please. 
Um, I grew up in a country of um, communism when it was truly communism in the sense that everybody has a job, the wage is almost the same. It's thanks to kind of an extreme redistribution system. However, we observe in that system that's the incentive to keep up with technology to push forward the productivity frontier is very much uh, lower than in other kind of societies. So I'm wondering to what extent that should be factored in when we're talking about workers being displaced. Any other comments? Okay, so just before, uh, uh, David, you can come up for the last paper. And just before we begin the final uh, paper, a couple of notes. Uh, so first off, a, oh, pardon me, yes. <laughs> thank you. If, if, if I'm allowed to say only one sentence, then it would be thank you very much to Tyler for all the stimulating uh, insights. Um, what really if you're allowed a second sentence? And if I'm, if I'm allowed one minute, then let me expand a little bit more, or let's say two minutes. <laughs> let me expand a little one bit minute. more on that. Okay. Uh, uh, so I, both Joe and I very much agree uh, with uh, most of the other comments who emphasize the practical difficulties of redistribution. And in fact, uh, the entire part of the presentation that I jumped over was about those practical uh, difficulties. So uh, I can use the remaining half minute to expand a little bit more on that. <laughs> uh, one thing that is a beautiful tax to redistribute would be carbon taxes, because it takes care of two social evils, inequality and environmental pollution. And a bunch of other fixed factors fall into that category. A second thing uh, that we emphasize very strongly is that a lot of jobs in the service sector, which is the sector into which the economy is evolving, uh, don't have wages that are market determined. So wages in, for example, healthcare, education, and sectors like that are to an important extent determined by public policies. And that gives us actually a, a wide range of possibilities to affect uh, the level of redistribution a little bit because we all agree that in practice you don't want to have these lump sum transfers. So thank you very much and let me refer you to the paper for any further details. 